trivial exercise to verify it has to be the same in both problems. <laughs> no. um, as, you recall, um, as you recall, last lecture, I told you I was going to find uh, the same object we found, uh, had found a few minutes earlier by a rather lengthy sequence of investigations using a totally different method, which I described in my characteristic colorful way as the method of the missing box. We would start out with classical particle mechanics, summarize that, summarize how that extends to quantum particle mechanics, summarize how classical particle mechanics is extended to systems with infinite numbers of degrees of freedom, indeed continuously infinite numbers of degrees of freedom, classical field theory, and then by going down this way as it happens, although we could just as well go this way, find uh, quantum field theory. Thus I begin with the summary of the classical mechanics of Lagrange and Hamilton. Classical particle mechanics. Classical particle mechanics deals with a uh, systems that are characterized by uh, dynamical variables that are ordinary numbers and fun real numbers and functions of time called the generalized coordinates, which I will denote with a superscript QA of t, where a goes from 1 to n. In the most simple system, these may be um, the uh, coordinates of an assembly of particles moving in three space, xi, uh, where i goes from 1 to n over 3. It's, of course, assumed then that n is divisible by 3. And these represent the three Cartesian coordinates of uh, each of the particles, or for that matter, the three spherical coordinates of each of the particles. Uh, Lagrangian systems are those whose dynamics are determined by a function of, called Lagrangian that depends on the Q's, on their time derivatives, which I indicate with the dots, and possibly explicitly on the time. The Lagrangian determines the equations of motion of the system via a universal principle called Hamilton's principle. We define a function called the action. A historically, by the way, it is not the action that's first introduced by Maupertuis. That's a different function. The integral between two fixed times dt of L. This is a functional of particle motions. It, this is a rule that assigns a single real number to any possible motion of the particles, or of the system, I should say, between times t1 and t2. The dynamics is determined by Hamilton's principle, which is the statement that if I consider a small variation of the Q's, I use script delta to indicate an infinitesimal variation. The Weierstrass revolution in uh, mathematics, in calculus, has not yet reached this lecture. We are Newtonians. <laughs> the in, the uh, where delta QA is subject to the restriction that it vanishes at both of the endpoints of the integration, then for any such variation, the change in S is zero. This is Hamilton's principle. From Hamilton's principle, one can derive equations of motion by the standard methods of the calculus of variations. One simply computes delta S for a general such change. T2, dt, dl, bq dot a, 
the change in Q dot A plus DL DQA times the change in QA. And here I have made a slight step in notational uh, uh, simplification above every elementary mechanics text in the world by adopting the Einstein summation convention so I don't have to write a bunch of sigmas. This is a chain rule, a chain rule of differentiation. Yes? No. Oh, it may, but this doesn't say change the time. It just says change QA. <laughs> Now, uh, we define, since it turns up again and again in our equations, dl dq dot a, I call pa. And of course, from the definition of what a small change in qa is, delta q dot a is ddt delta qa. Thus, uh, by substitution and integration by parts, we obtain delta S, which is supposed to be equal to zero, is integral from T1 to T2 dt minus d by dt pa plus dl dqa delta qa. Since delta QA is supposed to be an arbitrary infinitesimal function, or if you will, an R constant infinitesimal times an arbitrary function, this implies restricted only by vanishing at the boundaries. This, of course, implies that this quantity in square brackets must vanish everywhere. And thus, we obtain the equations of motion d by dt pa minus dl dqa equals 0. And these are called the Euler-Lagrange equations. Are there any questions other than when are you going to get onto something new? <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to go through it to remind you all. Okay. I pr will not do specific examples. I presume you've all seen how this works out for a particle in a sy system of particles with potentials and velocity-dependent forces and all of those things. Now, this is gives us halfway through the first box. I said I would do the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian formulation. And here's the Lagrangian formulation. I will now discuss the Hamiltonian formulation. We consider the expression PA QA dot minus L. This thing is called the Hamiltonian. And it is to be thought of as a function not of the QAs and the QA dots, which is a natural way to write the left hand side but of the Q's and the P's, and of course, possibly also the time. <clears throat> the Hamiltonian, um, I will just tell you, later on, in fact, we'll prove it in the course of another investigation, but I will tell you as information you may remember from classical mechanics, that if the Lagrangian is independent of the time, the Hamiltonian is identical with the energy of the system. We conserve quantity whose conservation comes from time translation. Of course, if the Lagrangian is not independent of the time, there is no conserved quantity whose conservation follows from time translation invariance. So we can call it the energy if we will, but that's just nomenclature. Someone else may call it the blood. <laughs> the, uh, 
If we can, let us consider the variation of the Hamiltonian, and now not varying functions of time, but simply varying the q's and the q dots, or equivalently the p's and the q's, at a, a fixed time. dh, the change in h, is pa dqa dot plus dpa qa minus the dl dqa dot, which is pa times dqa dot, minus dl dqa times dqa. Sum on a always implied, of course. It's just a chain rule for differentiate. Ah, uh, yes, I did. Thank you. We observe that the first and the third terms cancel. And thus, by the definition of the partial derivative, we see dh dpa equals qa dot and dh dqa equals um, uh, d minus dl dqa, which we already know from the Euler-Lagrange equations, is minus pa dot. By the way, I've arranged my upper and lower indices so that uh, it's just a matter of definition, of course, but so that uh, things look like they do in relativity. Differentiation with respect to an object with a lower index gives you an object with an upper index and vice versa. <coughs> These are the Hamilton equations of motion. I presume they are also familiar to most of you. And I shall not bother to give specific examples. However, if there is someone in this room to whom they are not familiar, I will give specific examples. Is there any such person? Yeah. Now, I would like to make, this is a standard derivation as given, but I should like to make a point that is sometimes not made in elementary text because it is a point we will have to confront several times, not in this lecture, but in subsequent lectures. In order to go from the Lagrangian formulation to the Hamilton formulation, there are certain conditions which the PAs and QAs must obey as functions of the PA dots and the QA dots. down the words and then I'll explain what I mean. Complete and independent. Tacitly, I am assuming that these functions, the q's and the q dots, have two properties. One is that it is possible to write the Hamiltonian as a function of just the q's and the p's. Maybe that's not so. Okay, in most simple cases it is so, but uh, it's very hard to prove in general that it is always so, and I can write examples where it's not so. So uh, the, this is a condition which we mean completeness. That is to say, it is possible to express the q's and the q dots as functions of the p's and the q's, at least to an extent, such an extent that it is possible to solve, write this object as just functions of the q's and the p's. By independence, I mean that I can make independent small variations of the Q p's and the q's at any time by appropriately choosing the variations of the q's and the q dots. If I couldn't make such small variations, if there were some constraint coming from the definition of the p's that kept me from varying them all independently, then I couldn't get from this equation to this equation because I couldn't vary them one at a time. Now. To give a specific example where they are complete but not independent, consider a particle of unit mass constrained to um, move on a unit sphere. 
Now we know there are, if you know any classical mechanics at all, you know there are two ways of doing this problem. You have three dynamical variables, really, three x's, three components of the x, of the position vector of the particle, and you can go to some coordinates in which you have only, the, only two variables, like spherical coordinates, and uh, then you don't have any equation of constraint, and off you go by the standard methods. Alternatively, you can write things in terms of Lagrange multipliers. That is to say, you can write a Lagrangian, which is one half x dot squared, plus or minus, it doesn't matter, some Lagrange multiplier times x squared minus 1. And by the method of Lagrange multipliers, which I hope you all know, or if not, take five minutes this afternoon to read the appropriate section in chapter 1 or 2 of Goldstein, the, uh, if I stick this thing in as, in as Lagrangian, I get equ precisely equivalent equations. By varying with respect to lambda, I obtain the equations of constraint. And by varying with respect to the three other variables, I obtain the equations of motion with the force of constraint on the right-hand side. Now, this is, from the viewpoint of Lagrangian mechanics, just as good a Lagrangian as the other one. However, it does not allow passage to a Hamiltonian form by the straightforward procedure, because the canonical momentum associated with the variable lambda, which I'll call p sub lambda, happens to be zero. On account of, there is no lambda dot in the Lagrangian. This is not an independent variable. I cannot get Hamilton equations of motion involving the three components of x and their conjugate momenta and lambda and its conjugate momenta on account of I cannot vary with respect to p sub lambda since it is zero by definition. This is true, but this, which appears to be such an evident consequence of it, is false. Okay. Does that emphasize the point? There is no method of Lagrange multipliers in the Hamiltonian formulation of mechanics, as we all know. Yes, sir? Hamiltonian would be well-defined anyway. Oh, certainly. The total energy exists. And in fact, in this case, they are complete. You can write things as functions of, uh, you can write the energy as functions of the, uh, of the x's and the y. And you the don't need the You don't need p lambda, in fact. It doesn't appear in the energy. But uh, <coughs> nevertheless, you, uh, th uh, you up to this stage is fine for this system. It's going from here to here where things break down because they aren't independent. In particular, zero is not an independently variable quantity. <laughs> yeah. This is just something to keep in the back of your mind because all of the examples we will do in this lecture, in fact, everything will be complete and independent, but then in later lectures we will get to things where they're not. And if you have a Lagrangian system in such a form where you do not have a bunch of independent variables, and then you have to beat on it in the same way we beat on this system by going to spherical coordinates and eliminating the Lagrange multiplier until you get it into shape where you can go to Hamiltonian form. This completes for the moment my discussion of the first box, classical particle mechanics. Are there any questions? Good. We now go to the second box, canonical quantization and uh, uh, canonical uh, and quantum particle mechanics. gotten here. I'm now going to explain this arrow and something about what lies at the end of the arrow. Of course, not everything about quantum mechanics. That's, of course, by itself. <laughs> the um, canonical quantization is a uniform procedure for, given a classical mechanical system in Hamiltonian form, obtaining, by turning a crank, a quantum mechanical system. It is certainly not the only way of getting quantum mechanical systems. For example, if you took a 251 or a parallel course, you knew you didn't take care of the theory of electron spin by starting out with the classical theory of spinning electrons and canonically quantizing it. However, it is a way, and it has certain advantages. I will first explain the prescription, 
and then explain what the, uh, is, uh, what, uh, the ambiguities that inevitably plague it, and then I will explain what the uh, advantages are. <clears throat> the quantum mechanical system has a complete set of dynamical variables that are the Q's and the P's of the classical system. And I will abuse notation by using the same letters for them instead of in one-to-one -one correspondence with the Q's and P's of the classical system. And I will abuse notation by using the same letters for them instead of writing them with capitals or calling them op or something. <coughs> like these system, these um, quantities time-dependent Heisenberg picture obey certain equal time commutators, which I write down, that are universal independent of the system. They are trivial except for the QP commutators, and the QP commutators are also trivial. <laughs> There, of course, is an h-bar in this formula when you traditionally write it down on the right-hand side, but we're keeping h-bar 1. The Hamiltonian of the classical quantum system is the same as the classical Hamiltonian, except it's now a function of operators. That is to say, the operator that generates infinitesimal time evolutions of the quantum system is the classical Hamiltonian function of the quantum P and Q operators. Please notice that this prescription is inherently ambiguous. It doesn't tell you what order you're to put the P's and Q's in when you write out this expression. In the classical expression, it doesn't matter if you write p squared q squared plus q squared p squared or whether you write 2p q squared p. But in the quantum theory, it does make a difference. I choose that particular example because in that case, the, uh, the ambiguity cannot be resolved just by saying the quantum Hamiltonian should be Hermitian. The, um, the, um, if this is just an ambiguity that we have to live with. This does not define a unique theory, except in especially simple cases. For this reason, we always try and write our quantum systems in uh, coordinates where the ordering our classical systems before canonical quantization in um, coordinates where the ordering ambiguity causes the least damage for particles moving in a potential. We usually quantize the system directly in Cartesian coordinates. And then if we are to do a uh, transformation to spherical coordinates. We do that after we have quantized the system. That is to say, after we have written down this Schrodinger equation. <coughs> Why do we do this? It is a rule which I have explained with an ambiguity, which I hope I have also explained clearly. But why on earth would any sane person, or even an inspired madman, have written down this particular rule rather than some other? Well. The reason is, the only motivation for connecting a classical mechanical system with a quantum system, the correspondence principle, the statement that the quantum system, in some sense, should reproduce the classical system if for that set of experiments for which classical physics goes, it gives a good description. This happens here because um, the canonical commutators imply that if I take QA with any function of the P's and Q's and take its commutator via the Hamiltonian, I simply get I from the I up here, DH, D, PA, because the only thing in this expression with which QA does not commute is PA. And if there's one PA, I get one. If there's two PAs, I get, if there's PA squared, I get two PA. If there's PA cubed, I get three PA, et cetera. Thus, the um, 
universal quantum mechanical equation of motion, the quantum mechanical definition of the Hamiltonian, that thing which generates the Heisenberg equations of motion, tells us that QA dot equals minus I, H with QA, which is dH dPA. Likewise, PA dot is, PA is just another operator by quantum mechanics, the commutator of PA with H, which because of the minus sign when I switch around the canonical commutators, gives us dH dQA. That is to say, canonical quantization is a prescription that guarantees that the Heisenberg equations of motion for the quantum mechanical system are identical in form with the Hamilton equations of motion for the corresponding classical system. This is an expression of the correspondence principle. Because if we consider a state in which classical mechanics offers a good description, which means, among other things, a state where, at least for the duration of our experiment, the expectation value of q to the nth is the nth power of the expectation value of q within our experimental accuracy. We don't notice q is statistically distributed. And the expectation value of the nth power of p is likewise the nth power of the expectation value of p. And then by taking the expectation value of these equations, we observe that they represent, that is the mean value of the particle position and momentum, obey the classical equations of motion. Of course, if the state is, doesn't obey that classical condition, is not a, within our experimental accuracy, a sharp wave packet in both P and Q, then quantum mechanics gives different results than the classical physics. But of course, that's always true. <laughs> Therefore, this is a mechanical way of making sure the system obeys the constraints of the correspondence principle. Once we look at it this way, we see why the ordering ambiguity is something we pretty much have to live with. Because um, the ordering ambiguity, although it is not clear in the units I have adopted, is evidently an effective order h bar. The difference between p q squared p and a p squared q squared symmetrized is a difference of order h bar. And therefore, no matter which way we order it, we'll still get the same classical limit. This concludes my rather brief discussion of the arrow, the descending arrow, and the second box. So we have taken care of this and this. Okay, physics uh, 208 and physics 251 in one half hour. <laughs> well, of course, there's a lot more to be said about these systems, and we'll return to them occasionally to get clues to say some of those things. But that's the only part of them I will need for this lecture. Are there any questions? Now we come to something that might be novel to some of you. The uh, extension from classical particle mechanics to classical field theory. Now, in general, the only difference between classical particle mechanics and classical field theory is that in one case one has a discrete number of variables and the other case a finite number of variables and the other case one has an infinite number of variables. These infinite number of uh, dynamical variables, say in Maxwell's electromagnetic theory, are labeled sometimes by a continuum index. Instead of worrying about the position of the first particle, the position of the second particle, the position of the nth particle, one worries about the value of the electromagnetic field at every spatial point and the value of the magnetic field at every spatial point. That is to say, instead of having QA of T, one has a set of fields. I make no assumptions about their Lorentz transformation property or even the Lorentz invariance of the theory at this moment. I will shortly phi A of x and t. The, um, these fields may be components of vectors or scalars or tensors or spinners or whatever. <laughs> I don't care about that at the moment. The, uh, the important thing is to remember in the analogy is that in going from here to here, 
the analog, it is not that t is analogous to the quadruplet x and t, but that a, the index that labels the variable, is analogous to a and x. Here you have a bunch of dynamical variables which evolve in time. Here you have a bunch of dynamical variables that evolve in time, interacting with each other. Here the individual dynamical variables are labeled by the discrete index A. Here the individual dynamical variables are labeled by both the discrete index A and the continuous index X. The fact that X is continuous is in fact irrelevant because if I wanted to, although I shan't, instead I could just as well trade for these variables, their Fourier coefficients in terms of some orthonormal basis. And then I would have a discrete set say harmonic oscillator wave functions, if you will, and then I would have a discrete variable replacing x. The big difference is that it's infinite in range, not finite in range. I will still keep with x because I presume you all know that in manipulating functions of uh, variables, it doesn't matter whether you use a discrete basis or a continuum basis to describe them, whether you use harmonic oscillator wave functions or delta functions. It's just that when you use a discrete basis, you have a chronic or delta, and when you use a continuum basis, you have a direct delta. Okay, is this point clear? Otherwise, the rules are exactly the same. In general, I have some Lagrangian that is determined by some complicated functions, or the phi a's at every spatial point and their time derivatives, and I just go carrying on the system. However, I will instantly make a simplification. Since we are in the final analysis, leading interested only in Lorentz invariant theories, uh, <clears throat> if we have a action, S, that is the integral of something that is local in time, it seems that it should also be the integral of something that is local in space, because space and time are on the same basis in Lorentz transformations. Likewise, since it only involves first time derivatives, it should only involve first space derivatives. Therefore, we'll instantly specialize from this general framework, which I have not even written down, to the special case in which the Lagrangian, the ordinary Lagrangian in the sense of the first box, is the integral d cubed x of something called a Lagrange density that is, in general, some function of phi 1, phi n, some function of d mu phi 1 to d mu phi n, and possibly some function of the space-time position, as we will, uh, we will indeed consider Lagrangians that depend on this position when we consider systems subject to external forces. Okay, this is a specialization. There are, of course, many non-Lorentz invariant theories that obey this. Most of the theories that ascribe hydrodynamics, a continuum system, obey this. And most of the theories that describe uh, elasticity obey this, are of this form. But there are many that do not. For example, if we consider the vibrations of an electrically charged crystal, we have to insert the Coulomb interaction between the different parts of the crystal, which is not expressible as an integral of a single spatial density of the crystal variables. It's a double integral involving the Coulomb-Greens function. <laughs> okay, but this is the thing we will specialize to. This means the action integral no, sorry. When we write down an expression of this form, of course, whenever we have infinite number of degrees of freedom, we have to worry a lot about questions of convergence. I, of course, will use typical physicist slot fashion and avoid such worries simply by ignoring them. But uh, it should be said that in this, there is, of course, so this object is well defined. It is tacitly assumed that all the phi's go to zero. As x spatial x goes to infinity, we will only consider configurations of, of that sort. Otherwise, the Lagrangian would be a divergent quantity and everything we do would be evident nonsense. So without saying more about it, I will establish a rule that we assume whenever possible, whenever necessary, that the f not only that the phi's are sufficiently differentiable so that we can do all the derivatives we want to do, but also that they go to zero sufficiently rapidly so we can do all the integrations by parts we want to do. And I leave it to mathematicians to worry about how rapidly sufficiently is. <laughs> now
Now the action integral is defined, as always, as the integral dt from t1 to t2 of L, which I could also write as the integral, only the time variable is restricted, d4x of the Lagrange density. I should have written the name of this on the board. <coughs> this enables us to derive the Euler-Lagrange equations from this. It's useful to, um, in this case, since if the system is Lorentz invariance, Lorentz invariance is now manifest. It's useful now to treat all four coordinates as analogous to t. This is a bad thing to do for Hamiltonian dynamics, but a good thing to do for this particular problem, and just do all four in necessary integration by parts in one fell swoop. So let's do that and derive the Euler-Lagrange equations. Delta S equals integral. I won't bother to put on the restriction symbol. D4x dl d d mu phi a delta d mu phi a plus dl d phi a delta phi a. Following closely upon my um, development in uh, particle mechanics, I will simply define an entity called pi mu a, which is equal to the partial of L with respect to phi a. And I will make the observation that delta d mu phi a equals d mu delta phi a. I can now perform an integration by parts. The uh, space derivative, um, uh, van the space boundary term vanishes by um, by my assumption that everything goes to zero is spatial infinity. And the time boundary term vanishes not from that assumption, but from the universal condition attached to Hamilton principle, that I only consider variations that are unchanged at the, that are zero at the initial and final times. Thus I obtain delta S, which should be equal to zero, equals integral d4x minus d mu pi mu a plus d script L d phi a delta phi a. Since delta phi a is an arbitrary function aside from going to zero at spatial infinity and at the time boundaries, I deduce, just as in the particle mechanics case, the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion. Okay. These are the same Euler-Lagrange equations of motion derived from the same Hamilton's principle as in the other case. All that we have changed is had an infinite number of variables, and we have specified that the Lagrangian depends on these infinite number of variables in a, very rest in a rather restricted way. Now, you may not be as familiar with these equations. Let me see how far I've got. Well, that's the last page. Oh, I've gotten that far. Oh, no, no, no. I've only got that far. Okay. Now, so let me here pause from my general discussion to do a specific example. Once I do that specific example, maybe there won't be as many questions about the general discussion as there would be if I asked questions uh, for questions now. I want to find, construct a simple example. Well, the simplest thing I can imagine is Okay. 
one scalar field, one real scalar field, I'm assuming my variables are real, instead of a whole bunch of fields, phi of x. Secondly, simple usually means that the equations of motion are linear. To get linear equations of motion, one requires a quadratic Lagrangian because the equations of motion come from differentiating the Lagrangian. So we'll assume L quadratic in phi and d mu phi. So I'll get simple equations of motion, linear ones. And three, since I want eventually to be things to be Lorentz invariants, I want L a Lorentz scalar. That looks like a good set of criteria to use to investigate when constructing a simple example. Of course, this determines a thing completely. We must have L is some coefficient, which I'll, call, I'll put a one half in front for later simplifications, some unknown real coefficient times d mu phi, d mu phi. That's the only Lorentz invariant thing I can make that's quadratic in d mu phi. I can't make anything Lorentz invariant out of phi and d mu phi. If I multiply them together, I just get a vector. And uh, finally, I can have some other coefficient times phi squared, where a and b are arbitrary numbers. <coughs> now, I hate to um, work all the time with more arbitrary coefficients than I need. So we'll instantly make a simplification that comes from defining phi equals phi prime over square root of absolute value of a. So I'll get rid of the a coefficient. <laughs> Thus I find my simple Lagrangian is plus or minus, depending upon whether A is positive or negative, one half d mu phi prime, d mu phi prime, plus B over A phi prime squared. <coughs> uh, is that right, B over A? Yeah. Uh, from now on, I will drop the primes and just work with this, uh, we call this field phi. I'll never refer, refer back to my original field phi. So in fact, we have in this Lagrangian uh, just two um, elements of arbitrariness, a arbitrary real number, positive or negative, b over a, and the discrete choice about whether we choose the plus sign or the minus sign. We'll later see that this discrete choice is um, uh, determined by the fact that the uh, energy is uh, positive. That's sort of obvious because the Hamiltonian is linearly related to the Lagrangian. So if I take minus the Lagrangian, I'll get minus the Hamiltonian. And if it's positive in one case, it's going to be negative in the other. And if it's positive in no cases, if the energy is unbounded below in all cases, I wouldn't have looked at this example. <laughs> <laughs> Now, let's now use our general machine. Pi mu a, pi, which is there's no a index since there's only one field. Pi mu equals dl d, d mu phi, which we see the one half is canceled by the fact that we're differentiating a square. is simply d mu phi. And therefore, I have the plus or minus. Therefore, I have uh, the, uh, from this general formula here, I've dropped the primes, of course. I have d mu pi mu minus or plus b over a phi equals 0, because that is the partial derivative of L with respect to phi. Or, plugging in the definition of this, 
del squared phi minus b over a phi equals zero. Which is rather similar to the Klein-Gordon equation that materialized in the latter part of the last lecture. Which is, of course, another reason why I chose this particular example. Okay, any questions? Now I will ask, are there any questions about either the general formalism explained here or the particular example? Uh, I well, this is uh, d mu phi, d mu phi times g mu nu. It's a square, so when I differentiate it with respect to d mu phi, I get, uh, no, I get a factor of 2. The derivative of x squared is 2x. That's where the 1 half went to. Is that a satisfactory answer? Yes? A little point. Do you care about the primes or not? No, I've dropped the primes. Oh, I'm sorry. Don't you want um, the action to be a scalar rather than the uh, L to be a scalar? Well, if L is a scalar field, the action, which is the integral of L, well, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the conditions because we've gotten the action, those fixed boundaries. If we integrate the action from minus infinity to infinity, of course, then we would get a scalar by integrating a scalar field. If we integrate a component of a vector field, we would get garbage. Yes? Is, is that a real minus sign in front of the box squared? That is a, uh, I'm sorry, that is a remnant of an S. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. No, because there's a plus or minus here and the two of them cancel. Oh, by the way, Martin, can do, do the, uh, since these tapes are being made, do the questions from the audience come, uh, come over on the, on the uh, machine? Or am I answering questions that I've told to me by internal voices? <laughs> Okay, I will try and make a policy of restating them as long as we're recording this. Now, let us now go to the question of the Hamiltonian form. I'll postpone the Hamilton equations of motion for a while. I'll just try and derive the Hamiltonian in disguise as the energy. The question is, what is the analog of P? Well, it's pretty obvious what the P is. You recall that one way of defining P was by a partial derivative. That is, you could say, the change in L was PA dQA dot plus the other term, which I'll just write as no time derivatives. The, that's the definition of P. That's the definition of the partial derivative with respect to QA dot. It's the thing that multiplies QA dot with the summation. Now, in our case, DL, well, when we're talking about functions, there's an unfortunate change in notation that really makes no sense. We use a wiggly delta instead of a, a straight delta, d. But it's, of course, it's the same concept, the infinitesimal change of the, of the dependent variable under the infinitesimal change of the independent variables <laughs> equals delta integral d cubed x uh, Lagrange density equals integral d cubed x dl d d0 phi a uh, delta phi a dot plus also terms with no time derivatives. What their explicit form is, I don't care. There are some of them with gradients and some of them with uh, no, nothing differentiated, but they don't have any time derivatives. Now, this equation is parallel to this equation. Indeed, it's the same as this equation. Here, all of our summations are absorbed in the summation convention. Here, half of them are absorbed in the summation conventions, and half of them are written as integrals. 
But integrals are, in fact, the same things as sums. They're just the sums for continuous variables. And if you don't believe me, you can imagine expanding both this and this in a Fourier ba in some ortho orthonormal basis, like harmonic oscillator wave functions. And then the integral would be a sum. So um, really, the analog of um, PA, in fact, the thing that is PA for an infinite number of degrees of freedom, is an object I will call pi A equals DL dd naught phi A. Of course, it's also equal to our previous pi mu A with mu set equal to 0. So it's the 0, the time component of pi mu A, which represents which is the object that corresponds to, in fact, is the generalized version of the more canonical momentum. It is called sometimes the canonical momentum density, just to remind you it is a function of x as well as of a. Now, what about the definition of the Hamiltonian? In particle mechanics, we have H is PA, no D, QA dot minus L. We just transcribe this equation to the more general case, realizing that when things depend on X, summation is integration. And we obtain H is integral D cubed X. <coughs> Pi A, phi A, minus script L, because capital L is the integral d cubed x of script L. Phi dot, thank you. Phi dot is d naught phi. Equivalently, this is sometimes frequently written as the integral d cubed x of a quantity script H, and script H is called the Hamiltonian density. It's the thing you have to integrate to get the Hamiltonian. The um, <coughs> fact that um, we obtain the Hamiltonian the total energy in the time-independent case as an integral over x at fixed time is, of course, not surprising to find out how much energy there is in the world. You add up the amount of energy in every little infinitesimal volume. Let us apply these formulas to our special case. equals plus and minus one half phi dot squared, that's the z zero phi squared, minus grad phi squared, that's the minus sign from our metric tensor, plus our unknown constant b over a phi squared. Pi is the zero component of this equation, so pi equals simply phi dot, i.e. d naught phi at fixed x. Plus or minus, thank you. Therefore, h, the Hamiltonian density, that thing you have to integrate d cubed x to give the Hamiltonian, is <coughs> plus or minus. Everything is linear in that, so I'll just stick it outside and do the computation as if I were doing that thing. Pi phi dot, that's this term here, minus 1 half phi dot squared minus grad phi squared plus b over a phi squared. Replacing phi dots by pi, this equals 
since we want to write the Hamiltonian as a function of phi's and phi's to get the Hamilton equations of motion, which I will get to shortly. This is plus or minus one half pi squared. That's this term plus this term, and all the rest is simple. Plus one half grad phi squared minus b over a phi squared. Oh, that's right, you are. I brought it out in front. Any questions about this elementary algebraic exercise? No, that's correct. Everything has got a plus or minus sign in front of it. Oh, 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 right you are. I shouldn't have done it that way. Right. It's pi phi dot minus or plus. Thank you. That's now a correct equation. And the final equation is, in fact, correct. Since phi dot is plus or minus pi. Now, the fact that we want the energy to be bounded below means that the co pi and phi, the second order differential equation, on the initial value surface t equals 0, we can determine phi and phi dot, or equivalently phi and pi independently. So if we don't want the pi square term to have the possibility of becoming arbitrarily large and negative, we had better choose plus or minus 1 half equals, this is, these are consequences of h greater than or equal to 0, it implies plus or minus 1 half had better equal plus 1 half. That takes care of that choice. And if we don't want the phi square term to become arbitrarily large and negative, we had better choose b over a to be less than 0. A fact I will express by writing b over a as minus a negative number, which I will denote by mu. Minus the, sorry, minus the square of a positive number, which I will call mu. Thus, <coughs> our equations now have only one quantity unknown in it, the positive number mu, if we're to have positive energies. And I will write down what everything becomes in that case. equals one half d mu phi d mu phi minus mu squared phi squared. The equations of motion become box squared plus mu squared phi equals zero, the Klein-Gordon equation. The uh, canonical momentum is not now plus or minus pi but simply phi dot. And uh, the um, uh, Hamiltonian density is 1 half pi squared plus grad phi squared plus mu squared phi squared, a sum of three positive terms. Are there any questions either about the general formalism or the particular example? Without a pi fourth, you could have a negative mu squared? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's something we'll talk about in the second term. That's called a theory with spontaneous symmetry breakdown. It has two ground states, two states that minimize the energy. Here there is uh, only one, pi equals zero, and a constant independent of space and independent of time. That's the only way to get the energy equal to zero. If I had a five fourth and a negative mu squared, I would have two, the two zeros of the curve. The, on the middle board, going from the third equation to the fourth equation, mm -hmm. um, it seems to me like, okay, you change your third equation, you have one. Phi dot. Yeah, that's. Yeah, plus or minus pi squared there, pi squared. Mm -hmm. And then with the one half, you have 
I get plus or minus pi squared. Minus or plus. Look, the easiest way to keep the plus and minus sign straight is to realize that the passage from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian is linear in the Lagrangian. X A times the Lagrangian gives you A times the Hamiltonian. Therefore, just think of it as always having a plus sign and then stick in a big plus and minus at the end. <laughs> OK? Now, we can now go on and write down the classical Hamilton equations of motion in the general case. And we could write down, then proceed to canonical quantization. However, time is running on. And I will do things in one fell swoop. I will describe canonical quantization immediately. And uh, after all, whatever the form, this is just a same as the other system, same as the particle system, except that A runs over an infinite range, symbolized by the two variables A and X. So that part of the thing and that whole song and dance I gave about the correspondence principle should still be true. And therefore, I will describe now the missing box, quantum field theory. indices are AX, BY. Finally, we have phi A of X and T pi B of Y and T equals a delta times I. What delta? Well, for discrete indices, a chronic or delta. And for continuous indices, a direct delta. <laughs> this describes the Hamiltonian density. Is the, class, the quantum Hamiltonian is the integral d cubed h, where h is a function of pi 1 dot 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 by one dot, 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 and possibly also explicitly of x and t. Not in our example, but we might consider systems with external sources, external forces acting on them. This is exactly, this is not even a generalization. The only generalization is to an infinite number of degrees of freedom. This is exactly the same formula we wrote down for classic, for quantum, defined quantum particle mechanics. And exact, since I never worried about whether my sums on A were infinite or finite in all of my formal manipulations, I don't have to go through the computations again. They are the same computations. The only change is notational. For continuous indices, we write a sum as an integral. But every operation is the same once you learn that transcription rule. The whole thing goes through without alteration. The advantage of this procedure is that it reproduces the classical field theory in the limit where classical mechanics is supposed to be valid. There's just a lot more P's and Q's. Otherwise, there is no difference. Let us check this with our specific example by explicitly deriving the Heisenberg equations of motion and seeing that they give us the Euler-Lagrange equations. I won't bother to write down the equal time commutators for our specific example because they are these equations with the A's and B's reversed. There's only one phi erased, excuse me. There is only one phi and there is only one pi. Okay, <clears throat> so let's do it with the example. So H equals integral d cubed y a big one half in front, pi of y and t squared. I'll call the integration variable y because I want to use that for another purpose, plus one half 
gradient phi, no one half, of y and t squared plus mu squared phi squared of y and t. Okay? I will now compute by the universal rule for computing the time derivative of any operator that only depends on the canonical p's and q's and does not expend explicitly on the time, the Heisenberg equations of motion for pi and phi, just as in the particle case, we computed them for p and q. Now, for pi, first I'll start out with phi because that's easier. There's only one thing in here that phi does not commute with. That is pi. Therefore, phi dot equals i, phi of x and t dot, I should say. I will do this in tedious detail to pay my dues so that every subsequent such calculation I can do with lightning right rapidity equals minus i phi of x and t with h. This equals minus i. The only thing that does not commute is the pi squared. The commutator of phi with pi is a delta function. And the one half is canceled by the fact that there are two pi's to commute with. Therefore, I have plus i from the delta function. Integral d cubed y pi of y and t delta cubed of x minus y from the canonical commutators on the left-hand board. Is there any question about the operations I have done here? It's just commuting A with B squared. Okay. <laughs> the minus I and the plus I cancel. The integral is trivial. And thus I obtain pi of x and t. This equation should be no surprise to you. It is, of course, one of the two Hamilton equations. Secondly, I will commute pi. Do, I will compute pi dot of x and t. Equals minus i same universal Heisenberg equation of motion pi of x and t commutator with h. <coughs> Here there are two terms with which pi does not commute. The gradient term and the phi squared term. Let's write things out. We have a minus i from the previous equation. Since we're now commuting pi with phi, reversing the order, we have a minus i from the commutator. The one half is again canceled because we're always commuting with squares. d cubed y grad phi of y and t gradient with respect to y because it's a gradient with respect to y up here. I didn't write it in the notation, but uh, that's clear. Delta cubed of x minus y plus mu squared phi of y and t delta cubed of x minus y. Any questions about that commutator? I have used, of course, the rather obvious fact that the, gradient, the commutator of pi with grad phi is proportional to the gradient of a delta function, which follows from differentiating this equation with respect to y. The integral is also trivial, not quite so trivial as before, but because we have to do an integration by parts, but it is one I think we can do by i. So I obtain minus from the integration by parts, minus del squared phi of x and t, and from the other term, mu squared phi of x and t. And this should be pi dot. 
plugging in the definition of pi, plugging in the previous equation to eliminate pi and write a differential equation in terms of phi, we obtain phi double dot equals del squared phi minus mu squared phi, which is, of course, the classical equation of motion, the Klein-Gordon equation with some of the terms written on one side. Thus, we have checked in our specific example the consistency of the procedure and shown that the Heisenberg equations of motion up to ordering ambiguities, which are rather trivial for linear equations of motion, yield the classical Euler-Lagrange equations of motion. Any questions? By the way, much of this material in this lecture is covered in chapter 11 and 12 of Bjorkane and Drell, the first two chapters of volume two, in somewhat different way, so you might want to look at that. You don't need to look at it, but you might want to. Any questions? Everybody is happy. Now, we have obtained the Heisenberg equations of motion, the uh, Klein-Gordon equation, the field equations, the field, and the equal time commutators for our free scalar field in uh, two different ways, one of which occupied the first three legs. They, of course, define the same system, as I said. From here on in, I could go through everything I did in the first three lectures running backwards and show that the system defines an assembly of non-interacting Bose particles, spinless Bose, Bose particles, <laughs> et cetera, Fox space, the whole routine. We've obtained it in two different ways, one of which occupied the first three lectures and the other of which only occupied one lecture. Actually, if I'd have started out this way, I would have had to run over a lot of the material in the first three lectures in the opposite order, so it might have taken me two and a half lectures starting this way. In any event, we have two methods. One method is full of physical insight, I hope. I tried to put as much physical insight into it as I could. We built out the many particle space out of the one particle space. We, um, we knew why we wanted to look for a field. It wasn't because Heisenberg told us we had to look for a field. We had some physical reasons for it. We constructed the field. We found it was unique under certain simplifying assumptions. We deduced its properties, and then we showed everything was characterized in terms of the field. The other method is completely free of physical insight. We have this mechanical machine, like a pasta machine, canonical quantization <laughs> procedure. You feed in the dough at one end, you feed in the classical theory and the, and the rigatoni come out at the other, okay? The quantum theory comes out. It's totally mechanical. When you're done, you have a set of equations that character, you still hope characterizes the system, but you've got a lot of work to do to find their physical interpretation. Well, since I have characterized these two methods, praising the first so much, and uh, uh, being so pejorative about the second, you should not be surprised when I tell you that in the remainder of the course, we will use the second method almost <laughs> exclusively. The reason is very simple. The first method we could go through because we already understood everything. It was just a system of free particles in a box or on an infinite space. We had already had access to a complete solution to what the physics is. If we had tried to do method one for an interacting system, we wouldn't be able to get off the ground. If we want to introduce interactions in the canonical method, at least formally, then we just write them down. Here's an interaction. Here's a free theory. And I'll throw in an interaction. Better give it a minus sign, so the classical energy at least will be positive. There it is. There's an interaction between the system. Okay? We could do canonical quantization, at least formally, unless there's no problems with summing over infinite numbers of variables. And in fact, we'll see there are, but that particular nightmare lies far in our future. <laughs> the, we get a theory that, uh, you know, it looks like it has a nice energy bound to below. It's a uh, positive, uh, the Lux Lorentz invariant. Uh, everything commutes for space-like separations because they commute for equal times, and the whole thing is for space-like separations, and the whole thing is Lorentz invariant. So it's got all the general features we want it to have, and it looks like particles can scatter off of each other because if we do old-fashioned Born perturbation theory, in particular, the expansion of this thing will involve two annihilation operators and two creation operators, 
and therefore you can go from a t one two-particle state to another two-particle state. So there it is. We may not know what it means, but at least it's a cheap way of constructing an interacting field theory that obeys all of our general assumptions. Of course, <coughs> this means there's a lot of work to be done. Why did I write down this and not phi six? Well, you'll learn why I didn't write down phi six. <laughs> there's a reason for it. <laughs> but you won't learn that until <laughs> later on. Okay. But at least we've got some equations to play with that don't look as if they have any evident inconsistencies among them with the general principles of relativity and causality, and we can begin investigating the properties of such theories. <coughs> Therefore, um, it is such an investigation. I, I, I have one more thing I want to say about the free field, but I want to describe what we're going to be doing in the next few weeks. It is such an investigation that will occupy us for the next, uh, for the remainder of this course, essentially. And in particular, the early stages of such an investigation will um, um, occupy us for the next week and a half. For the next week and a half, I think, maybe I'll go fast and it'll be a week, maybe I'll go slow and it'll be two weeks, I don't know. We will investigate, though we will recapitulate those general theorems that apply to all Lagrangian systems from classical mechanics and which will therefore, particular ordering ambiguities, apply to quantum mechanical systems obtained by canonical quantization. In particular, we'll go through the connection between symmetries and conservation laws and talk about energy and momentum and angular momentum and the friends of angular momentum that come when you have Lorentz invariance. We'll talk about parity and time reversal, all for scalar fields. We'll talk about uh, internal symmetries like isospin, which after all exists for systems of pi mesons, which are scalar particles, so within our domain, and the discrete internal symmetries like charge conjugation and so on, all on the level of formal classical field theory made quantum by canonical quantization. And then when we're done with that and have those general things under our belt, we'll go to the real tough problem and begin it and start um, trying to wonder about how we compute scattering amplitudes and cross-sections in a theory of this kind. In the first instance, and indeed for the remainder of this term, just in the perturbation series in the interaction parameter lambda, and that will lead us to the famous Feynman diagrams and all the wonderful complicated combinatorics and things that go with them. <laughs> okay, but that's the general outline. I see I've spoken more than I thought. I gave an, I've given an outline of the first term of the course, essentially. When we're done with all this for scalar fields, we'll go back to in the latter part of the course to spinner fields. And, and uh, after we've straightened everything out here, we'll see, we'll see that there are all sorts of new complications, qualitatively different, that are introduced by the fact that we have a lot of spin indices to take care of. But there won't all of the problems we will have solved in principle for scalar fields, we will have already solved by trivial extension for spinner fields. OK, that's an outline of the course, which I, got drag uh, which I dragged myself into. Now, uh, let's get back after I've explained, I've reached a position where I can explain to you where we're going. So I explain where we were going. Now that I've, uh, I've reached that point, let me do another consistency check for our uh, system. Uh, since we have phi's and phi dots that obey the canonical commutators and obey the Klein Gordon equation, we can, as sketched out in the last lecture, express the field in terms of annihilation and creation operators. Just as a consistency check, let us take such an expression, plug it into this expression for the Hamiltonian, and see if we get the same thing in terms of the energy for the Hamiltonian as a function of annihilation and creation operators as we started out with, as back in the previous lecture. So. That's a nice consistency check. So I define A's and A daggers by saying phi of x and t is integral d cubed p over 2 pi to the 3 halves square root of 2 omega p a sub p e to the plus i, I'll separate out the space and time part dot x minus i omega sub p t plus a sub p adjoint times the conjugate thing 
if you think you're bored with this equation, imagine how I feel. <laughs> you have a plus i omega p t. That's just our old formula written out in terms of space and time parts. Our game is to plug that into here, that is write one Fourier transform for one of the pi's and another one for the other of pi's, do the space integrals, and see if we get a familiar result. Yes. Now we can do some of the integrations in a very short order. In particular, we can do the space integration here in a very short order. Because integral dq always get a bunch of exponential factors. And integral dq y, either the plus or minus i, y dot p minus p prime is always over 2 pi cubed. Delta cubed of p minus p prime. So we'll get a lot of terms in our Fourier transform of this form. And we can do the y integral in one of the p integrals by i. We'll also occasionally get terms for mixing together an annihilation and a creation operator. Of, sorry, from two annihilations and two creations. Where we've got a p plus a p prime. And of course, that's just as trivial as delta cubed of p plus p prime. And that just sets p prime equal to minus p when we do the integration. So the sort of thing I'm envisioning and I don't want to write out is I take one phi of y and t. I should have called it y here. I take one phi of y and t and write it as an integral dq p. The other one is an integral dq p prime. And then do the x integration and do the p prime integration. What do I get for the Hamiltonian? I will now do this in one fell swoop on the sideboard, having so well organized my computation. Firstly, I'll get left over an integral d cubed p. Secondly, the two pi to the three halves that occur in the two fields will universally cancel each other in here to give us just a delta function. Secondly, I'll get a square root of two omega from one and a square root of two omega for the other. Sometimes p will be p prime and sometimes it will be minus p prime. But that don't matter since omega p is rotationally invariant. So I'll get two omega p. Now, otherwise I will obviously get four classes of terms. I will get a term with two annihilation operators. That will always be a sub p times a sub minus p, because I'll have an e to the i p dot x and an e to the i p prime dot x. And it'll be of the second form down here. It will always have a phase factor in front of it that is e to the minus 2i omega p t because each annihilation operator carries one of these phase factors. And then there will be some god-awful mess of which I'll just write the left parentheses, a combination from contribution from the pi squared, the grad phi squared, and the mu squared phi squared, and I'll compute those later. So leave that parentheses there. Then I'll have terms with one annihilation operator and one creation operator. There because the annihilation operator carries a plus i here and the creation operator carries a minus i here, They'll always, when I do the integral, have the same momentum. <coughs> they will also have no time dependence because the time dependence will cancel. Likewise, I'll have a sub p adjoint a sub p, and I'll have a sub p adjoint a sub minus p adjoint times something. Now I'll fill in the somethings. Oops, sorry, and that of course always has a time factor, either plus i, plus 2i. I will run five minutes over, make a pt. Maybe even 10, I'm feeling good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, now let's write down the individual terms. Sorry I'm being so tedious about this. Pi squared, 
Oh, I'm sorry, there will also be a big one half in front. There's a one half in front of our whole expression. Okay. Pi squared. Pi is d naught phi. Thus, in this case, I get a plus I a minus I omega p from one annihilation operator and a minus I omega p from the other. So that gives me minus omega p squared from pi squared. Here I have one annihilation and one creation, so it's a plus I and a minus I. Likewise down here. And the fourth case is like the first. Now the grad phi squared. Grad phi, operating on this thing, gives me a plus IP. And since this one has minus the momentum, that gives me a minus IP. So that gives me P squared. Here, both of them are P, but one is an annihilation and one is a creation. So I still get P squared, and likewise along the line. Mu squared is easy. That's just mu squared, no matter what the operators are. That completes the computation of the integral. Now, we observe that there is a certain simplification here. For example, this term is 0. And so is this term. Of course, we could have checked that out in a priori grounds. We know the equations of motion should tell us the Hamiltonian is independent of the time. If it's independent of the time, it's not going to have any factors like this in it. <laughs> These terms don't simplify so drastically, but they still simplify. This one is 2 omega p squared. And so is this one. Therefore, we have, we're going to get a surprise. That's what I'm going to run 10 minutes over. We're going to get. <laughs> the 1 half stays. The 2 omega p squared over 2 omega p is omega p. And then inside, we have AP, AP adjoint plus AP adjoint AP. This is almost but not quite what we expected, and I will comment on the not quite momentarily. However, are there any questions about the uh, somewhat tedious but unfortunately necessary computation to which I, which I have devoted the previous eight minutes? <laughs> Just plug this and this and evaluate it, and you get this as the answer. No. The, um, this is not what we wanted. It differs from what we wanted by a constant. And that constant is infinite. Because this is, of course, integral d cubed p omega p. AP adjoint AP plus the result of commuting these two objects, which gives us plus 1 half the delta cubed of 0 times omega P. It's only the first term we want. We don't like that second term. Of course, we can see physically why the second term came there if we think of the analogy between this system and a harmonic oscillator. We have an infinite assembly of harmonic oscillators here, but we haven't got the minus 1. We wrote things just as if they were p squared plus q squared. And therefore, we get the zero point energies in the expression for the individual oscillators. And since there is an infinite number of oscillators, we get a sum infinite zero point energy. Just doubly infinite. Infinite because of delta cubed of 0, and infinite because integral delta cubed p omega p is infinite. By the way, if we put the system in the box, one of these uh, infinities would disappear. The delta cubed of 0 would be replaced by the volume of the box. But we still have the other one. Now, what can we say about this, aside from making expressions of disgust? Well, firstly, there was some fast talking you let me get away with at the end of the last lecture, probably because you were tired. 
where I said, well, we've got the commutator, the equations of motion and the equal time commutators determine everything because they tell you the commutators of the annihilation and creation operators with the uh, energy and therefore they tell you their energy raising and lowering operators and therefore they determine everything except for the zero point of the energy, which we don't care about. Well, that's still true. They have determined everything except for the zero point of the energy. And if we still want to say we don't care about it, we can say infinite from infinite is just zero, so I'll drop it. It's just a constant, excuse me, so I'll drop it. I can always put the zero of the energy wherever I want. An alternative way of saying the same thing is that I, canonical quantization gives you the right answers up to ordering ambiguities, and the only problem here is the order. <laughs> so therefore, I will use my freedom to get rid of ordering ambiguities by defining those terms ordered in another way. <clears throat> this, will turn, this idea, although it sounds silly and brings universal ridicule, <laughs> Well, by the way, the most significant feature of this calculation is I'm being very cavalier about the treatment of infinite quantities. And if you think it's bad this lecture, wait until a month from now. <laughs> the, the, uh, the, um, this seems to be, a, this is in fact a profitable way to proceed. And therefore, I will define an unconventional ordering, way of ordering expressions made out of free fields only, which I will call normal ordering. So I'll write down that definition, and then I'll show you that normal ordering defines the right ordering. Let phi a1 of x1, etc., to phi a n, xn, be a set of free scalar fields. There may be a whole bunch of them with different masses and so on. The normal ordered product indicated by colons to mean this is not to be interpreted as the ordinary product is the expression reordered Annihilation operators on the right, and a fortiori then all creation operators on the left. That is the definition of normal ordering of the normal ordered product of a string of free fields. That's it. Okay, I don't have to tell you the order of the annihilation operators because they all commute with each other. You just break every field up into annihilation and creation parts, and you shove all the annihilation parts on the right. Okay, so this breaks this up into a sum of two to the nth terms, and each of those terms is redefined by sticking all the annihilation operators on the right. Seems like a dumb definition. Nevertheless, take my word for it, this concept will be very useful to us in the sequel. The no name is a little bit bad because normal ordered product means you s causes some students to get confused and weaken the head because they think you start out with the ordinary product and then you apply an operation to it called normal ordering. That is not so. This whole symbol, the string of operators and the colon, defines something just as AB defines the product of the operator A and the operator B and that whole thing is defined by this. Now, this enables us, of course, to write down the proper formula for the Hamiltonian in terms of density, in terms of local fields. One half colon pi squared plus grad phi squared plus mu squared phi squared. 
that just tells us that whenever we run across a product of an A and an A adjoint, we put the A on the right and therefore the A adjoint on the left, what could be simpler. To advance this elaborate definition, to just take care of what I said in words five minutes ago, may seem extremely silly to you. But as I say, we will use the normal ordered product again and again in this course, and this is the first occasion we have to use it, and therefore I introduce it here. And this concludes what I wish to say about canonical quantization of the free scalar field. Next lecture, as announced, symmetries and conservation laws in particle mechanics and in field theory, the energy momentum tensor and all that stuff.